Speak now, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. As we wrap up our sermon series on the life and message of the Apostle Paul, we'll be reading from Acts chapters 19 and 21, as well as from uh, Paul's love letter to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, And this is Paul's third missionary journey. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No. We've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, but he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. And then Paul went to Ephesus, and after being there for a while, here's what happened in Ephesus. Also, many of those who became believers confessed and disclosed their practices. A number of those who practiced magic collected their books and burned them publicly. When the value of those books was calculated, it was found to come to 50,000 silver coins. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. About that time, no little disturbance broke out concerning the way. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the artisans. These he gathered together with the workers of the same trade and said, Men, you know that we get our wealth from this business. You also see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and drawn away a considerable number of people by saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of Artemis will be scorned and she will be deprived of her majesty of her. Then Paul, after leaving Ephesus and traveling to a few other places, made his way to Jerusalem. And when he told a few of his friends he was going to Jerusalem, this was their response. When we heard this, we and the people were urged We and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And then when he was in Jerusalem... He had to defend why he didn't live according to the law. And here is what he explained in 1 Corinthians as his way of spreading the gospel. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. 
To the weak I became weak so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I might by any means save some. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today is the last Sunday in our sermon series, The Life and Message of the Apostle Paul, the first Christian theologian who interpreted the significance of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for all those who would be Jesus' followers. But he not only was a theologian, he also physically took that message and spread it throughout the Roman Empire. So this morning we focus on that third and final missionary journey. You can see from the map, which you probably won't be able to read on the screen, all those little um, names, because it covers such a wide range of territory. So you may want to refer to the front of your bulletin cover. As we trace Paul's footsteps, he starts from Antioch, which you might remember is where every missionary journey began. That was his home church in his hometown. And he goes what they call by the interior road, which means he goes by land, heading to Tarsus, which you might recall was his childhood hometown. And then he most likely visits many of the churches he had established, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, before heading straight to Ephesus. Ephesus is where he spends the next 27 months of this journey. It's the longest amount of time he has spent in any city. Now, you may recall last week when we were talking about his second missionary journey, he really wanted to go to Ephesus, and he did for a few days, but he promised to return. And so now on this third missionary journey, he's making good on that promise, and he goes to Ephesus. It's it's a 700-mile journey to get there. probably took many, many months, and it's all captured within one sentence of the book of Acts. Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Why Ephesus? Why did Paul want to go there? Well, it's estimated by some that Ephesus was the fourth largest city of the Roman Empire with a population up to 250,000 people. But more than just its size, Ephesus was a, a commerce and trade capital. You can see that it's on the sea, the Aegean Sea there, And so it received a lot of ships, a lot of commerce. There was a trade route there. So people from all over the Roman Empire would be kind of coming and going throughout Ephesus. So if Paul could make his mark on Ephesus, if he could convert some people, especially the merchants and the people who were traveling, they would then go back to their hometowns or they would continue their trade route and continue to spread the gospel. So Paul was very intentional about wanting to go to Ephesus. And when he gets there, one of the first experiences he has is with about 12 Christians, what we read in our scripture today. He approached these Christians and basically said, so have you all heard of the Holy Spirit? And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. Now, these were people who had been baptized. They were followers of Jesus, but they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them more about baptism and reminds them that John's baptism pointed to Jesus. And John said, you might recall, that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And so Paul baptizes them again, this time in Jesus' name. They receive the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. I think it's interesting that the first experience that Paul has in Ephesus is not with Jews, it's not with Gentiles. He didn't even, as was his custom, go to the synagogue to preach. Instead, he encounters people who were already followers. 
but he felt a need to take them deeper, to help them experience at, a, at another level exactly what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And it's the first application for our lives also. When they say, no, we've never heard, we've never experienced the Holy Spirit, well, what about us? Have you received the Holy Spirit in your life? Have you experienced the power of what that Spirit can do? Now, everyone's experience is different. We don't all have to speak in tongues or run up and down the aisles, but but have you experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Because it's that spirit that changes us, that transforms us and guides us and leads us, whispers to us and nudges us along the path that God wants for us. It's the Holy Spirit that comforts us, that helps us to interpret Scripture. The Holy Spirit is God with us here and now. Have you experienced the power of the Holy Spirit? How can we be more open, more receptive to the Spirit's work in our lives? That was Paul's first experience at Ephesus with Christians, asking them to go deeper, to experience more in their faith. Well, as I mentioned, Paul's there for about 27 months, longer than any other city that he had visited. It was obviously very important to him to invest that much time and energy into preaching and establishing a strong church in Ephesus. And apparently he was very successful because we find out later on, now maybe this is a year and a half later, maybe two years later, we find out the impact Christianity has on this huge city of Ephesus. We find out in the book of Acts that a number of those who practiced magic collected their books and burned them publicly. And that when the value of these books was calculated, it was found to come to 50,000 silver coins. Now, first of all, we hear about a bunch of people who practice magic, and maybe we think about Harry Potter. Okay, this wasn't Harry Potter. When they say practicing magic, they're, they're talking about spells or prayers, incantation, things that you would do or say that would get the attention of the gods that would have them give you what you were looking for. So if you wanted to get pregnant, if you wanted your crops to produce abundantly, if you wanted healing from a sickness, then you would go to that spell, that incantation, that kind of prayer, and you would do it often and offer your sacrifices to that particular God who was responsible for that particular blessing, and then you would receive it, presumably. Well, that's what these spells and incantations were, and they were very expensive, because you can imagine If you want something good to happen to you, and here's the key to it all, if you just buy this book, you'll get all the answers. You'll get what you want. It was an expensive endeavor. In fact, we're told that when these books were burned, it was 50,000 silver coins. You see, what was happening is that the Christians started to realize, wait a minute, I don't need to buy this expensive book anymore. I don't need to put my trust in that God or goddess anymore because I'm putting my trust in Jesus. I don't need those prayers or spells anymore because I'm going to rely on Jesus for my sense of peace and for health and for wholeness. And so the Christians who owned these things already decided to burn them in public as a way to show that, you know what, this is just meaningless. 50,000 silver coins. One silver coin was about a day's wage. So to put it in perspective, if you consider what, about $100 is a day's wage maybe today? 
Well, 100 times 50,000 is $5 million. That's what the Christians burned in public, $5 million worth of these precious books that could solve all your problems up in smoke as a witness to the power of Jesus Christ in their lives. Now, they could have sold them and gotten $5 million for them and used that money to support Paul or to, or to feed the hungry or to do their work in the church, but it meant that somebody else would be putting their trust in those meaningless gods, and they didn't want to lead people astray. That was the power of the gospel in Ephesus to those Christians. So the gospel has an impact on what they're putting their trust in. And there's another question for us today. Does the gospel still have that impact? Does it impact what you put your trust in? And you may say, well, Chris, I don't have a book that promises to solve all my problems, so that doesn't apply to me. But I know there's some people in this world who will say, you know what? If I just win the lottery, it would solve all my problems. I would be happy. I could pay all the bills. I could give away money to the poor or to my church. If I just won the lottery, I'd be happy. What else do we put our trust in for happiness? If I just had that bottle that would numb my pain, I'd be okay. If I just had that bottle of fountain of youth to put over my face, I'd be young forever. If I just had a, a, a certain level of, um, in my IRA, if I just, well, you can fill in the blank. What do we put our trust in? And how do we let go of that, put it aside, so that we could put 100% of our trust in Jesus Christ? You see, sometimes people think that, well, I'll be happy if when everyone gets along in my family. Or I'll be happy when all my list of things to do are checked off. But in the end, we come here every Sunday proclaiming that our peace and our hope and our happiness are only found in Jesus and nowhere else. So how does the gospel impact what you put your trust in? Well, getting back to Ephesus, the other thing Ephesus was known for is it, housed, it was a tourist attraction because it had this temple of the goddess Artemis. Now, this temple was no ordinary temple. It was actually considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was magnificent. And so people came from all over the empire to come to this temple. The, the people in Ephesus felt like they were the guardians of this temple, that they were the guardians of the goddess Artemis herself, and she was the goddess of women and fertility and crops and animals and all sorts of things. So people would come with their needs. They would come to worship her, to offer a sacrifice to Artemis, to pray for whatever it is that they were seeking at that time. Now we live in a tourist area. You know what tourism can do for a city. People have to spend the night if they're going to travel to the temple. They have to buy food. And of course they want souvenirs. So the souvenirs that they were buying were these little statues of the goddess. And they would take these statues home and put them on their mantle. They would put them in their houses and they would worship her and offer her sacrifices. Well, the people that made those little statues, well, they had a good business. They were selling these to all the tourists who would come. And the, it, the silversmiths were the ones that 
mostly made these statues. Well, as Paul's influence began to grow in Ephesus, people started to realize we don't have to go to the temple to sacrifice to this goddess anymore. And why are we buying these little cheap little trinkets, but they weren't cheap was the problem because they were made of silver. Why are we buying these souvenirs? We don't need this goddess if we have Jesus in our lives. So here's what Paul is preaching and it starts to have an economic impact. And so we read that there's this man called Demetrius, and apparently he's in the silversmith business, and apparently he's selling these statues, and he's not very happy that his revenue is decreasing, not only his, but every other silversmith in town. So he gets together with all of them, and he, and he goes from shop to shop, and he says, you know what? You know what the problem is here? You know why we're not making as much money as we used to and why our business may actually go out of business if we don't do something about it? It's all because of Paul. Paul is convincing people that they don't need these little trinkets and statues anymore, and nobody's buying them. And he gets... It's almost like a riot. He gets all these people riled up. Yeah, yeah, it's all the fault of the Christians. And so they just seize some of the Christian leaders who are around there. Now, Paul is not there at the time. And they drag him off to the big theater. Now, this theater holds seven to 10,000 people. And they drag him off and they say, you know, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And for two hours, there's this this whole riot in the middle of the theater with some of the Christians' leaders there. Now, you know Paul by now, and you know Paul's like, I'm going to go in there and preach to those people. And his friend said, oh, no, you're not. You're going to get yourself killed if you go in there. And so they keep him from entering the theater. And after about two hours, the um, authorities come in, and they say, you know what, this is an illegal assembly you have to disperse immediately and if you want to take it up you need to go to the court system well they never went to the court system but Paul realizes that maybe it's just time that he move on and so he did 27 months after her arriving he continues his third missionary journey But the gospel had such an economic impact on that city that business owners actually were willing to seize and kill some of the Christians because people spent their money differently because of their faith. So we ask ourselves that same question. Do you spend your money differently because Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Does your faith have an impact on your wallet and your checkbook? Do you buy certain things or not buy other things because you believe? Do you buy locally or environmentally friendly products? or How do you spend your money differently because you are a Christian? Maybe some of us choose to live our lives intentionally on less than we could so we can give away more. Or we can put it the opposite way. What do we spend our money on that maybe we need to rethink? You see, our faith affects how we live. It affects all of how we live, including how we spend our money. In Ephesus, the gospel had such an impact that some businesses were going out of business because they were selling things that weren't compatible with the Christian faith. So I'll ask you to reflect on how you spend your resources. And is there anything that's incompatible with the Christian faith? Any ways that God is calling or leading or nudging you to spend your resources differently because Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Are we putting first things first in our lives? So Paul continues that third missionary journey, and you can see that uh, 
Well, it's quite a long line from Ephesus. He, he goes up to Troas, kind of in the northwest. He goes again to all the churches he founded, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth. Then he doubles back and visits them all again. Finally goes down to Miletus, where he calls some of the, his Ephesian leaders, says goodbye to them, and then eventually makes his way toward Jerusalem. Why was Paul so keen on going to Jerusalem and visiting all these churches that he had just established? Well, Paul decided that he was going to take up a collection, an offering for the mother church in Jerusalem. Now, scholars don't know if there was a famine or a drought or some kind of economic hardship, but there was a dire reason why Paul felt the need to take up this offering and deliver it himself to Jerusalem. But the other reason why it was so important is because it was obvious there was a dividing rift happening between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, and this was a way to bring them together. This was a way for the Gentiles to contribute to the Jewish Christians and say, you know what, we're all in this together, we're all a part of the body of Christ you know, and, and here's our tangible way of expressing that unity to you. And Paul was going to take it personally to Jerusalem. Now, he hadn't been there in a long time, ever since the Jerusalem Council, where he argued that the Gentile Christians didn't need to be circumcised. But he also knew that there would be a lot of hardship and suffering, and perhaps Jerusalem would be his very last stop in his life. And when he shared this to the people in the leaders in Ephesus or with his friends, they begged him not to go. They said, Paul, there's still work for you to do. You need to help us and support us. You need to continue to spread the gospel. Don't go to Jerusalem if you think you might die there. And that's when we read in Scripture what Paul's response is to them, for I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So maybe like Jesus, you know, when he set his face toward Jerusalem and he knew Jerusalem would be his last stop, stop here on earth, Paul had the same feeling when he went. And as he knew, when he was in Jerusalem, he went to the temple to worship. And believe it or not, some Jews from Ephesus were in Jerusalem at the time. And they said, hey, we know that guy. That guy preaches that you don't have to follow the law of Moses. He's not Jewish. He shouldn't be allowed in the temple. And they start talking and getting all riled up and they end up seizing Paul, and they're ready to literally just rip him apart, so angry that he would go in the temple of the faith that in their minds he's destroying. The Roman soldiers step in, more, out, more to protect Paul than anything else. They arrest him and put him kind of under protective custody, and they send him to prison in Caesarea. He's in prison for three years without a trial. In that time, there are two governors in that area, and he testifies to both of them. He even testifies to King Agrippa, who makes the comment of saying, well, I don't know what the big deal is. I don't know. I don't see anything wrong with him. But he stays in prison, and finally he says, you know what? You guys aren't going to do anything about this. You're going to keep me in prison until I die. So I'm going to appeal my case to Rome just like appealing it to the Supreme Court. Because he was a Roman citizen, he had a right to do that. He appealed his case to Rome, and if you read the book of Acts, you will see that it was quite a trip going from Caesarea to Rome. There was a shipwreck, and all sorts of things happened. But he finally gets to Rome, and the Roman Empire, the Roman government says, blasphemy? Well, that's not a big deal. They didn't have the same passion that the Jewish leaders did against Paul. And so Paul was put under house arrest. He rented a house. He could go kind of wherever he wanted. He had a personal Roman soldier who basically became his friend. 
and for two years he was in Rome writing letters under house arrest. And finally, at the end of the book of Acts, Luke tells us that after two years, Paul was released and he continued to spread the gospel. That's how the book of Acts ends. But we know from historical documents what happens to Paul. When he is released from that house arrest, it's probably around the year 62. And nobody knows exactly where he went after that. Some say he went to Spain, others say he stayed in Rome, and others say he traveled back to see a few more of his churches again. But we know he returned to Rome in the year 64, two years later, because there was a huge fire in Rome at the time. It just decimated whole sections of the city. 200,000 people were left homeless, and it was usually in the poorest areas where it was completely burned down. And the emperor, Nero, he just so happened to have a, a whole blueprint of plans about how to rebuild the city, which is why most people, the rumor had it that he actually hired people to set the fire in the first place so that he could rebuild the city. But in any case, Nero blamed the Christians for that fire. And so he arrested all the Christian leaders in that area. Not only Paul was in Rome at the time, but Peter was also. And so Peter was sentenced to execution by crucifixion. And at his request, he asked to be crucified upside down because he felt he was unworthy to die in the same way that Jesus did. And because Paul was a Roman citizen, his execution was not by crucifixion, but rather he was beheaded, a more nicer sentence. He was 55 years old, more or less, when he died. 30 years after his conversion experience on the road to Damascus, 16 years after his first missionary journey, and eight years after his arrest in Jerusalem. You see, Paul was called. He was called to live the life he did. He was called to suffer extreme hardships. He was called to travel thousands of miles across the most dangerous terrain. He was called to help interpret the significance of Jesus' life. He was called to preach that gospel to anyone and everyone who would hear. And yes, he was called to die for the sake of the gospel. But you see, not only Paul has a call. We do too. So what is your call? What has God placed on your heart? Where are you willing to go or to be or to do in order to share that good news of Jesus Christ? To whom are you willing to speak in order to tell them about the difference Jesus has made for you? And how will you intentionally live out the call God has for your life.